Right, after uh, Nico's uh, introduction to the archaeology of the area, I would like to continue by uh, yeah, telling you a little bit about the project context and uh, yeah, how we have uh, proceeded in the project over the past uh, four years. Uh, so it says approach, results and prospects, but I guess it's mostly about the approach and uh, a lot of the results will come during these two days and we will also talk about uh, all kinds of challenges and prospects during the next two days as well. So where did this all start? Actually, the idea of uh, applying for this project originated uh, back in January 2011. You can see there was a lot of snow in Switzerland at that, uh, at that time. I was invited uh, to a workshop in Basel uh, that was uh, named Calculations in Archaeobiology and it was organized by people who were basically very much interested in archaeobotany, archaeozoology, and uh, working on the Roman period in yeah, Northwest Europe. Uh, so United Kingdom, Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, uh, the whole Limes zone was sort of uh, their field of interest. And that was uh, really a very interesting, uh, interesting workshop uh, to be with, also because of the beautiful location where we uh, could relax next to the fireside and have nice chats in the evening. Um, but yeah, one of the things that immediately struck me that in the discussions uh, there was hardly any mention of using GIS and spatial analysis uh, for questions of trying to calculate, for example, the uh, yeah, possibility of surplus production for a particular context along the Roman uh, frontier. There certainly wasn't any kind of simulation modeling going on. And yeah, to some extent, I would say, okay, Roman archaeology seemed to have been completely ignorant of what had happened in a lot of uh, yeah, digital computing. And that was a bit surprising to me since I had not really worked in that area before and uh, was not really aware of the kind of discussions uh, in a lot of other uh, areas that I've worked in, especially in prehistory. Uh, it was much more common to discuss these kind of things. So I was invited there to say something about current paleoeconomical approaches uh, in GIS. So I talked a little bit about uh, concepts like site catchment analysis, how you could do that in GIS, uh, how you could set up agricultural potential models. And I also uh, explained shortly something that uh, yeah, I had been thinking about with uh, my colleague Tom Whitley in the United States, how you could do predictive modeling in a way that it's not just a statistical uh, trick to calculate how many sites there could be in a particular area, but to also think about why these patterns actually uh, occur. And yeah, this idea of what uh, he called cognitive predictive modeling is also very much at the basis of what has been happening uh, within simulation modeling and in particular agent-based modeling. So at the time in 2011, it was quite obvious, I think, that agent-based modeling was going to be a very important development uh, in, in this field over the next few years, especially uh, since there was already a very big project that had been run in the United States, the Mesa Verde project by Timothy <coughs> Kohler and his colleagues uh, in, at the University of Washington. So there was a lot happening at that time, and yeah, it seemed like there was really a niche in uh, this particular uh, area of archaeological research. So what I try to do, also because the money for my previous project ran out, is to write a project proposal that would yeah, try to uh, combine these aspects. This was uh, submitted with uh, NWO, the Dutch, uh, scientific, uh, Dutch, Dutch Organization for Scientific Research, which basically manages all the research funds uh, within, uh, within Dutch academia. And they have this uh, program that they call the Innovative Incentive Scheme, uh, which builds from uh, uh, postdoc projects for just one person, which I was working at at the time, two postdoc projects that actually include a somewhat larger team, and this is called, uh, the first one is called the Veni, the second one is called the Vidi, and there's also one called the Vici, and yeah, then obviously you have to 
take things even to a higher level. But this one was uh, yeah, intended to apply for a five-year project with one principal investigator, which was me, and two PhD students, which I hadn't found at that particular point in time. Submitted in October 2011, eventually granted in May 2012, and started in September, which was the day that my previous contract finished. Um, yeah, basically the whole idea is in this sentence that is in the project proposal, the ambition was to develop quantified spatio-temporal paleoeconomic scenarios of agrarian production in a complex context. <laughs> the complex context, Nico already explained, is basically the Dutch Limes, the, the area that has yeah, lots of data but also lots of questions. The agrarian production basically came out of the discussions in the, in the Basel workshop as a field where this might be really interesting to, uh, to start working on. Especially since paleoeconomy is a field where yeah, I think a lot of debate uh, has been going on for a long time. And yeah, the thing that is really important then is the, uh, is the development of the quantified spatiotemporal scenarios. And for this, you would actually need to apply uh, methods like agent-based modeling. So this is uh, what we have been working on. Uh, as you see, we have also traveled around the world. There are fortunately, fortunately not a lot of pictures of me actually presenting, but uh, there you see some from uh, Rome and uh, one from Oslo, and Jamie and Mark uh, standing on a tower looking over the Dutch Limes. Um, I'm just basically uh, showing you uh, stuff that I put in the proposal, uh, just to set the scene basically, because I had in mind that there were two kinds of research questions that might be interesting to, to look at. Uh, first of these are basically methodological. Uh, yeah, the basic question, how can you use these new modeling techniques uh, to try to understand this interaction between the economic activities going on in the area? And these were specifically uh, defined as agricultural animal husbandry and wood production, uh, the last one uh, because it seemed to be an aspect of land use and uh, and production that had not been really looked at in a lot of detail. Well, what we did have, of course, were a lot of models, expert judgment models usually, sometimes partly quantified, and yeah, these need to be translated into formal simulation models, so that was a methodological uh, question as well. And then, obviously, uh, since you need to base these models on certain data uh, to start modeling, but also to check the outcomes, yeah, how can you actually use the available paleoenvironmental and archaeological data to first start, uh, first create these starting conditions and also then to check whether it is any good or not. Coupled to these were research questions that were more of an archaeological theoretical nature, uh, basically Question one, what kind of scenarios are we actually looking at that would be uh, the kind of uh, scenarios that would explain what we see happening? Maybe these models, yeah, if you construct them in the right way, they can actually tell us something new about the way the Romans organized production, transport, and distribution of goods in the area. Because, yeah, they needed a lot of stuff in order to manage their military infrastructure. And also... There were interactions, as Nico said, between the Roman army and the local population. Perhaps the models could be used uh, to say something about that as well. And also about the interplay between the natural environment and the sociocultural effect factor factors that influence the development of the cultural landscape. From this, uh, yeah, the objectives were to actually try to produce some new perspectives on this development of the cultural landscape in the Limes area. Uh, basically, I said, well, what we need to do here is uh, translate what we have in terms of theoretical approaches into these models, and we should focus specifically on the, uh, the scale dimension. Uh, we have to think about both uh, the macro-regional scale and the local scale. We have to think about the chronology, the temporal dimension, how do things develop through time, and we have to think about this interaction issue, how do these things have an influence on each other. This would also mean uh, that we would have to produce a new set of tools or best practices, <coughs> procedures, how to use spatial dynamical modeling and in particular agent-based modeling. So 
First of all, we wanted to connect these models uh, of subsistence production, for example, from this very basic household level to the regional and super-regional, uh, to see if we can connect uh, this to also ideas about natural vegetation development, and in the end also to find methods to confront the model outcomes with the available data. In the end, this uh, boiled down into a research plan. Uh, stage one actually uh, had to deal with reconstructing the landscape, basically because we needed to have estimates of productivity for the crops, for woodland uh, and for livestock. We also had to know where living conditions were suitable for habitation. We wanted to know where possible transport route might have been located, and this all had to be based on available uh, paleogeographical and archaeobotanical data. Also, we had to look at the paleoeconomy of the area, what kind of parameters uh, are actually relevant uh, concerning past economic activities, and yeah, where were certain resources located, what was their nature, uh, what were the quantities that we were talk talking about, again, focusing on agriculture animal husbandry and wood management. And all this obviously based on the available uh, data plus some statistical and uh, GIS based analysis. And then the spatial dynamical modeling itself, departing from yeah, what already was around uh, in terms of demographical uh, models, agricultural production models, wood consumption models, based on, as I just said, the cognitive predictive modeling framework, which basically uh, is talking about uh, the idea that agents, uh, people, uh, have choices that they can make, that they uh, can be conscious in these choices, and that the decisions that they make will actually have an impact on uh, other people, but also on the landscape itself. So it's a very basic framework, but <coughs> that's the thing uh, that we started from. Um, we also wanted to supplement agent-based modeling with uh, some other techniques because at the time uh, ABM was uh, still not very good at dealing with spatial data. We also wanted to have a look at network analysis techniques which was only partly implemented as well. At the moment I think these things are improving rapidly. Um, of course then we had to define the appropriate economic and sociocultural scenarios in the area and in the end try to test against the settlement distribution data. So. This is what uh, what I wrote in the proposal, um, which uh, the reviewers uh, thought was a good idea to try, and uh, which NWO gave me in the end the money for. Um, so, when I started, the first thing uh, we did actually was try to find uh, two uh, PhD students to do this kind of work, especially because the aspects are quite different uh, in approach, I think. And. Uh, Jamie Joyce was the first actually uh, to uh, uh, to be hired. Uh, his background is in uh, archaeobotany and uh, he really had to sort of find his way into modeling. But uh, yeah, I think uh, the combination of the two has been a very, uh, yeah, a very fruitful one. Uh, so you will hear a lot about that. Mark, uh, on the other hand, is coming from a geoarchaeological background, so his uh, his background is much more in GIS and also in dealing with uh, with paleogeography. So yeah, both together uh, covered quite a bit of a uh, bit of the stuff that I wanted to do. Uh, however, initially I had sort of thought that uh, one of the PhD students would be spending a lot of time on the archaeological data. In the end, it was me that did most of that. Uh, well, so. But that was fun as well. Mm. Okay, <coughs> project setting. Nico already uh, showed you quite a bit. Uh, yeah, just to get the very basics, uh, the periodization of the Roman period in the Netherlands starts around 15 BC when uh, the Roman legions uh, are stationed here uh, to actually help in the uh, in the campaigns uh, in Germany. Uh, slowly the area gets more and more uh, included into uh, into the Roman world. Uh, around uh, at 70 AD, uh, 69 AD, we have the famous Batavian revolt, when the Batavians uh, yeah, try to uh, 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 to assert uh, yeah, a sort of independence, I guess. And uh, 
at that after that time uh, the situation changed considerably uh, the limes as a fortification zone was already created around 50 AD and uh, around 70 things really yeah got more uh, more organized uh, there was a new province created and uh, then the middle roman period uh, starts uh, that lasts until approximately 270 AD uh, at that point in time, uh, there are several invasions uh, from German tribes, Germanic tribes, and that means that, uh, say, the Limes as a fixed defense line is more or less given up. Uh, the Romans withdraw in the in the bigger towns, and the late Roman period in the area, in that sense, is also much less known than the Middle Roman and Early Roman period. Uh, Nico already also showed you a, uh, a map of the area. This is a basic paleogeography map. Uh, you have to realize that the area uh, looked quite different from what it uh, does today. The courses of the rivers, while still more or less recognizable, have changed uh, quite a bit. The position of the coastline has changed a bit. And uh, the Roman frontier obviously was uh, on the border of the Rhine. You can see that they built a lot of uh, forts, castella, on this uh, on this border. You can also see from this map that uh, we actually know quite well where these were located. In the west of the area, in the east of the area, the information is uh, much less secure. The Batavians were living in the east. Uh, they had Noviomagus, current Nijmegen, as their capital city, and then the smaller tribe, uh, which I always find very difficult to pronounce uh, in English, uh, the Cananifates. They uh, occupied the western uh, zone near the coast. They also had a small uh, capital city called Forum Hadriani in current Forberg near, near The Hague. You can also see that the area in between, which is all given in, uh, in brown, was sort of uh, yeah, no man's land. It was a very marshy area where very little uh, evidence of, uh, of occupation is found. So this is basically uh, yeah, the state of knowledge that we had at the start of the project. All the little gray dots that you may see were uh, fine spots from the Roman period. And this is where we, uh, where we had to start. So, yeah, in a nutshell, the project uh, looks like this. We have, uh, we have data coming from archaeology, paleogeography, archaeobotany and archaeozoology that tell us something about certain aspects of the area. Uh, tell us something about consumption production, tell us something about the infrastructure, tell us something about the natural landscape. Then we have conceptual models, some of them more quantified than others, about how people actually lived in the area, what, uh, what was the labor force, the settlement density, and also some information on the macroeconomical aspects, uh, like Nico also said, uh, so where were the big markets and what, uh, what were the options of transporting goods from one place to the other. Uh, obviously, the project itself has concentrated on the lower area here, trying to uh, build those models on the basis of existing, uh, existing digital techniques, and focusing on these questions of uh, subsistence and surplus productions, population development, and the interaction between the local and the Roman, and trying to do this at various scales. So, yeah, it looks quite big. It is quite ambitious, I think, and yeah, some things that just, just don't go according to plan. I think when I was uh, thinking about landscape reconstruction, I sort of underestimated the possibilities of reconstructing uh, the natural vegetation uh, uh, I, at the time. Uh, at the same time, uh, a project uh, started at University of Utrecht that was actually looking at uh, these issues in a lot of detail. So. In that sense, uh, we also decided that we didn't need, need to actually pay a lot of attention to this because there was another team working on it and yeah, we have on and off been profiting from what they have been doing and uh, the actual reconstruction that we made uh, is very much also thanks to the work that has been done at the University of Utrecht. The archaeological data analysis was also a little bit more complex than, uh, than I had assumed, and I will uh, tell you a little bit more about this in, uh, in the afternoon session. So yeah, actually going through all the archaeological data and trying to figure out uh, its, uh, its value uh, took the better part of, uh, of one and a half years, so that was a little bit more than I expected. 
Um, when you look at the paleoeconomic analysis, uh, one thing that uh, yeah struck me struck us quite early, I think, is that yeah archaeological data offers a lot of anecdotal evidence. Uh, yeah, we can say things like okay, uh, this must have happened, that must have happened, but not like. Uh, how much was actually produced, uh, how many people lived there. That kind of information is really, really very difficult to get from the archaeological data. So we had to yeah, make up numbers uh, at some point in a lot of, uh, lot of cases. But that's also, I guess, uh, what you get when you're doing modeling. You can actually make up things on the go and see what happens. The macroeconomic patterns were not always uh, sufficiently clear, I would say. Uh, I mean, if you talk about uh, an issue like taxation, well, how much was the tax? Actually, there is no real information about this. So, yeah, you can say, okay, there is a macroeconomic issue here with taxation. But, yeah, when you start modeling, you just have to make assumptions. And in that sense, I think uh, what a lot of people working with this kind of models uh, experience is that there is sometimes a lack of uh, theoretical frameworks that would define the actual processes that are going that have might have been going on at the time. And that's yeah part of the work uh, that you need to do. Then, uh, from the technical point of view, uh, one of the things that uh, actually was much more complicated than, uh, than I had thought was doing the sensitivity analysis on the modeling. Uh, trying to figure out what the parameters actually do when you are modeling and uh, yeah, making sure that they, they don't produce results that are, for example, due to, uh, to effects of, uh, uh, of randomness or to effects of uh, putting uh, a certain uh, a certain element in the wrong place in your model so it happens too early or too late. Um, there's also yeah, an issue of software constraints. Uh, we have been working uh, almost exclusively in NetLogo for the agent-based modeling. I uh, have uh, actually uh, run also stuff in R for the statistical analysis and uh, also done some work with uh, uh, with a social network analysis uh, programs. Um, in the end, uh, I think what is really clear is that a program like NetLogo uh, is not really capable of dealing with very big data sets. And so if you are working with lots of agents that are interacting all the time, uh, the program will yeah, will start to slow down uh, considerably. Also, if you're trying to work in uh, yeah, bigger spatial settings, uh, like uh, the whole Limes area, then yeah, it's basically not, uh, not feasible to do this uh, within uh, a reasonable amount of time. So you would have to switch actually to program these things yourself or to actually rely on other uh, other solutions, which means that, say, the scaling up of the models, uh, if you go from the local level up to the regional level, is actually very, very challenging and something that we have not completely solved. Of course, there were also things that, uh, that went pretty well. Um, the landscape reconstruction, in the end, uh, is pretty detailed, uh, especially for the western part of the area, which is really, really a bonus, I think, compared to a lot of other areas uh, in the world, even, where this kind of very fine-grained paleogeographical data is usually not available. Uh, we also, I think, got uh, quite a uh, quite a better grip on the development of the settlement pattern in the area. Uh, I will talk about this in a little bit more detail later, but uh, yeah, one of the issues with survey data, as anyone working with this kind of stuff knows, is basically trying to figure out what is the chronological development. So we, uh, we think we have uh, made some progress there. And uh, yeah, we also made quite a bit of uh, progress, I think, in reconstructing the transport network. Uh, the paleoeconomic analysis, uh, yeah, basically, I think, uh, resulted in uh, finding quite good basic assumptions for agricultural production uh, in the area in the period. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, in some uh, some cases more challenging than others, but yeah, I think what we have right now is really something that uh, that can be used uh, further, and and especially where it concerns the wood management, I think that uh, yeah, we really. Uh, found some new uh, new insights. 
And uh, where it concerns the spatial dynamical modeling, uh, the work that Jamie has done uh, basically has resulted in a Roman farming model at the settlement level. And uh, yeah, it's the first one of its kind, of that kind of scope. So that's really a very good uh, result, I think. And uh, we are still working on the last uh, last analyses. But yeah, we have, been, we have been able, Jamie has been able to uh, produce scenarios of surplus production in the area that come up with really nice, uh, nice results. And I think we also made quite a bit of progress in yeah, how to actually deal with sensitivity analysis. And uh, Mark will show you an example uh, how we try to approach this in the, uh, in the Transport Network uh, reconstruction. So maybe some prospects and these are going to be very very general i think uh, yeah what challenges that yeah would still be open for the future and also in the remainder of our project still have to do with the sensitivity analysis uh, yeah how do you assess the uh, potential error margin of what you're doing and uh, what are the effects on the modeling results this is uh, yeah something that should really be i think at the center of uh, any kind of future modeling efforts then the scale issues I already mentioned. Yeah, we have been playing around a little bit with how you should do this. Uh, how you how do you do the temporal scales? How do you do the spatial scales? How do you how do you do the agent interaction between groups of people? Uh, yeah, like I said, it is challenging. Uh, there are software limitations involved, and uh, yeah, it's not something that we will be able to completely solve uh, for you, unfortunately. And then, yeah, I guess uh, the big thing for all uh, archaeologists, uh, so yeah, what can we actually get from it? Well, I think there are a few uh, things that make this, uh, this difficult or challenging. The first is that uh, if you model, uh, yeah, the basic assumption with modelers is always that you try to do things as simple as possible, and then they might not be really realistic. Uh, so there is, yeah, uh, there is a point where these things have to meet, and uh, yeah, I think that is also an ongoing discussion where do you actually uh, go from the fairly simple modeling assumptions to yeah what it would actually be considered a realistic model by archaeologists working in the area i've always uh, made the case that this could best be approached by uh, looking at it uh, using a middle range theory so actually uh, trying to focus on the actual processes that you're looking at and from there build the scenarios and see if you can uh, model any kind of underground effects but to be honest uh, this is indeed probably the best way to do it but to do it in practice is still i think quite challenging so that's it for me for the moment um